It's a small slice of heaven, placed down here on earth. Care for his trees, I water his son. I don't want it, I just rent it from God. Hello, everybody. We got an interesting episode for you today because we have a lot of wheeling and dealing to do and not much time to do it in. So my goal for the farm is to have a self-sustaining number of horses born each year so that I have young ones to trade and break and tr- and um, to finish out each year and I don't have to go all throughout the state looking for horses. To do that, I need more broodmares. Problem is... I'm out of money right now, but I just found two registered two-year-old fillies that are unstarted and that are fairly affordable, $1,000 a piece. Problem is I don't have the $1,000 a piece. So I talked to my wife, Emery, and this is my plan. I'm going to buy both mares, kind of evaluate them right off the trailer, pick out which one I think is the higher quality of the two or has the most potential of the two, and then spend the next two weeks training the other one to sell on the sale in Ava, Missouri during the World Championships on the 11th. That's only 14 days away. So that's what you'll see in this episode. From day one where we pick the mares up, evaluating them, and then the start of the two-week training process where we go from an unstarted, barely handled filly to a somewhat broke mare at the sale. And then you'll get to see if we were ultimately successful in our end goal of making our $2,000 back plus expenses and getting to keep another mare free and clear. This is the picture the man sent me. I bought them sight unseen, and they were quite a bit thinner than this when I picked them up, but these are the two mares. So step one, we got the mares home, and now it was time to evaluate them. Queen is a little bit bigger and a little bit prettier of the two mares, but I'm not looking for bigger and prettier. What I'm looking for is the quality of gait and for the potential for them to throw the higher quality show horse in the future. So I end up picking the other mare. Queen's very nice and she's traveling well here, but I'm but what I end up faulting her for is how she brings her front end forward. If you look at the knee joint, it stays bent all the way to the point where the front foot sets down on the ground. I want that front end fully extended and stroking out smoothly and setting down on the heel of the foot. I also want a lot of overreach on the back end, which Queen does have a good overreach. But now let's take a look at Nugget. As Nugget goes around, look at the smoothness that you'll see in her front end. Look how the knee joint is locked out in a straight line every time it's set down. And look at how that head is shaken with the engagement of each stride. That head shake on the Foxtrotters comes out of the shoulder. Watch how the point of the shoulder moves back and forward and the muscles engage almost all the way up to the to the withers. That's where the head shake comes from because they're putting a maximum effort and stride into each step. So although she's a much uglier mare in my opinion, she has a big head, a goosey neck, and a pot belly, I'll pick this mare over the prettier queen because of her smoothness of stride and quality of gait. This was the first day right after we had bought the horses, got them home, and checked out which one we decided to sell. Queen had never been down to the river, and it's one of the first steps I like to do. There's many benefits to taking a horse to the river right off. Horses naturally know how to swim. You don't, it's not something you have to teach. However, they do get a lot better at it after the first time or two. So this may not be the most elegant looking swim you've ever seen because she doesn't fully know what to expect.
So like I said, there's many reasons why I like to take horses down to the river. I think the main benefit, it comes with the adrenaline dump that they have. So it's a, it's a good way for a horse to get kind of anxious and nervous around you, but they'll, they will interpret you or view you as kind of the safety net and come to you for comfort in the water. It happens on almost every young horse I've ever taken down to the river. They get a little bit nervous, they swim, they dump out that nervous energy, and then they come to you for the break. The next benefit comes when the horse is calm. You as the rider feels a lot more comfortable climbing on and off of it with, with a green young horse not knowing what to expect because there's not as many consequences. The horse rears up, you just slide off backwards and fall in the water. If it bucks, it's not able to get off the ground and you, once again, just fall in the water. Um, the horse also will know you're having fun and your attitude with your confidence and just doing something enjoyable with the horse, they'll perceive that and they will start having fun too. They look forward to this water. And in the summertime when it's really hot, it, it probably just feels as good to them as it does to you. You'll notice every time I'm training a horse, whether riding it or on the ground, I'll have a four-foot buggy whip with me. People think that's for uh, disciplining a horse or being cruel, and it's really not. It's an extension of my arm. It's a tool. It's to help um, get the horse to learn cues and directions. I use it as much to scratch and pet the horse as a reward as I would ever use as a disciplinary action. Um, I'll slap the water with it. I'll help point with it. And uh, I think it's just one of the most useful tools you can have in training. <laughs> one more benefit to working a horse in the water is getting them to give to pressure. If you'll notice, she has to turn into this halter and lead rope a lot easier than if she was a young colt on the ground wanting to pull away from me. It really takes all the power away from the horse and it teaches them that cue to give to pressure. And really, all horse training is, is pressure and release. And um, the, the lighter that horse learns to release to the pressure, the better off your training will go. Later that night, after several hour break and a snack, we got her back out, and this is the first time we got on her with a saddle, and uh, this is still day one, I believe, and you can see the mare is not scared at all because of how many times you get on and off of them at the river. Once again, that's a benefit of the river. On the ground, when your first time getting on a horse, you typically won't get on and off 20 times and the more the better in the river you feel comfortable to climb on and off and on and off and that adds to the comfort of the horse it makes her um, confident that you're not going to hurt her and um, they'll they'll really accept a rider in the saddle much quicker i had already started working her in the round pin before becca got on her and started trying to teach her to flex her head both directions and to back up a little bit from the ground. 
Backing up is the first thing you need to learn when you get on a horse because that translates into being able to stop your horse. Believe me, there's nothing worse than being on a young horse that doesn't know how to stop. So when you're trying to ask for a backup at day one level, all it needs is one foot to go backwards right there. And then you release your hands, release the pressure. Remember what I said a moment ago. All horse training is, is pressure and release. So you're putting pressure on the nose band, asking the horse to step back. They step back, release the pressure. And that's how they will learn that cue to stop. This is day two, and we went down there for four days in a row and climbed on her and off of her. And um, by the fourth day, she was looking forward to it and was getting pretty comfortable. As you can see today, we've put a bit in her mouth. I use a sliding D-ring gag bit for training all my young fox trotters. While we were down there, some random floaters came by, adding some distraction, which is always good. The more things that happen around your horse, the more they'll get used to strange situations. <laughs> Now on day two, I have the bit in her mouth. All throughout day one, we practiced with flexing and giving to the pressure of just the nose band with a rope halter that has knots across the, the nose band. On day two, in the water, she starts to give and I'm always very quick to release whenever she gives me a good turn. But also, I have the halter on over the bridle so if she's having trouble understanding to give to the bit, I can always reach up and grab the halter uh, as like a secondary aid. This is the first time we've ever asked Queen to move from on her back without being led. It's a very common problem that a ho uh, young horse like that would get her f get what I call get sticky, where their feet stick and they don't they don't like to move. So I just have Becca come in and kind of get her unstuck from her spot 
with um, by leading her and and helping is like a another backup cue. Um, I don't get mad at her for getting sticky. It's it's very common, and we're going pretty fast with this little uh, two year old. She's uh, she's actually two and a half. She's plenty strong enough to carry us in water. I I'm a bigger person. I won't be riding her outside of the water. I'll let Becca do all that. Rebecca is um, 14 years old, but she's been working with horses since she was seven with me uh, instructing her the whole time. And she's become really a good trainer. And she just naturally has a feel for the uh, pressure and release type training method. As you notice there, I waited for Becca to give the cue to walk before I pulled the horse and got her feet moving. It's just a, another way of getting her to understand what these cues are. This is only about 10 or 15 minutes after our, I was on her uh, initially. And you can tell the mare's already starting to take the cue to walk and to steer without getting frustrated. And that's a good time to stop any lesson. Queen's making a lot of progress on day three. She's already learned to give to the pressure of the, the bridle and just to give to pressure in general. She's learning the cues to walk um, when I ask for it. So we uh, like to start driving them as soon as possible. I like to drive them for a day or two to get a good control on them um, before we put a rider on their back on the ground. Um, the tarps and the, and the bags and, and buckets and things or just to de desensitize them because when you're up there, your clothes are going to be moving around, your legs are going to be up against them. There's just, it's just a good practice to do. The next step we did with Queen was a little lead line. Got her up in the pasture where the grass is thick, and I got her on the uh, established walking path of the other horses. Don't do this with every horse, but since we're on a tight time schedule, and I really want Queen, you know, a little more past green broke Good in 14 girl. days. Yeah. We're pulling out all the stops. This was also on day three. The little short lead line like this helps to build strength and get ready for the riding to come. And also the, uh, the swimming that we did for the first four days. When we'd first get to the river before the scenes you saw of us climbing on and off of her, I would get to a spot where I could touch and the horse couldn't, and I would just swim her in circles uh, around me like a lunge line almost, but full swimming for, well, 20, probably 20 minutes. I would get kind of gauge by her breath and by her uh, look on her face, and I would just swim her till she got pretty tired. Um, that's very good, low resistant exercise and horses build strength a lot faster than people think. Okay, so this is Queen, as we said, we're taking her to the sale on Saturday and, uh, we bought her on the 28th and today is, let's see, the 9th. So we got 11 days of training in on her from, uh, from barely halter broke to now she's been on a few trail rides and she's really doing good. So the first thing you gotta do um, 
is get their mouth warmed up. You just saddle her up, and she's going to fight her mouth because um, she's a two-year-old. She don't know any better yet. So my theory is they can either fight their mouth with you in the saddle, and you're pulling on them, and they associate that fight with you and the rider, or you can take a D-ring gag bit, it's a snapple, and it's on a slide. The tighter it gets, the further it slides up here. So that's a D-ring gag. See how it slides? Take your rope reins, oh babe. Run them up underneath your saddle. Find out where about snug would be. Time in a knot. Then you pull her chin in, put it over the saddle horn, and you just get away from her. Because now, she can sit there and think about it. It's not just ungodly tight, but once you see that nose starting to tilt in and go down, where she gets away from the pressure, then you know she's, she's starting to give to the bit. It's a little bit uncomfortable, I'm sure, and I'm sure people will hate on the comments, but you know what? Five minutes of displeasure to get a point across so that you're safe the rest of your life is not too much of a price to pay. And this keeps her from associating humans with the, uh, the cause of her mouth having to uh, give to the pressure of the bit. It warm and it kind of warms her mouth up, gets ready for a lesson. Then I'm the person who gets to come and release the mouth, and she's kind of happy to see me get there to ride her. Even though Becca's doing all the riding on this one because the mare's a little small for me. Standing there for about five minutes, she rested in that back leg, and before I came in here, she was licking and chewing, kind of showing that she's relaxed with that bit. So I'll walk up, and with, all I gotta do is just take it back up, off of the saddle horn. She's actually two and a half. She was two May the 4th, Star Wars Day, and it's September now. Uh, it's always good to just not, you don't just run in there and jump on them. Saddle them up, let them stand around for 20 minutes, you know, fight this thing slowly. And on a two-year-old also, you don't cinch them up like you do a eight-year-old trail horse. You don't put your knee in them, you don't lift, you just snug it with your fingers each. And if it gets if it gets to where you can't do it with just your fingertips, it's, it's tight enough. If it's going to fall over, you get somebody to hold your saddle up. You know they need to they need to be able to breathe and they need to be comfortable and they need to work work their way up to these things. Anyone? 
thing I like to be able to do is get their hips to disengage. What I'll do is I'll tuck, tilt the nose in just a little bit. Good. Put a little pressure on that hip. You know, put your focus on it. Point at it. They know what you mean. Do both sides. Good. After she learned to drive well, we started riding her in the barn. And you don't just make oval circles. Every once in a while, you'll turn a circle or two or do a figure eight in the path. And then we started trail riding. The first two trail rides we did, we had I, I rode along with her with a guide horse, the one that she would follow. But as soon as, as, soon as you feel able and feel like you'd be safe, you need to start riding them by themselves because they learn more by themselves. Um, they're not just relying on following in their herd instincts. We rode her probably seven or eight days in a row after we started breaking her. Um, yeah, I'd say by the fifth day we were riding her, um, and she did very well. On a young horse like this, you don't want to ride them more than about a mile without a break, and we also never ride downhill on a young horse like this until we feel their strength grow. Um, uphill, they can handle it more. It's not, not too much of a thing. Um, maybe not a steep mountain, but every time we're going down a steep part where they would really have to know how to handle the weight, we get off and lead them. Okay, today's sale day. Me and Emery had to get up at 5 o'clock to uh, wash and pack or let the kids sleep in. We got to wash Big Easy here, give him a bath, give Queen a bath, pack the trailer and head to Ava, Missouri, about a two hour drive. Hopefully, we can, uh, we can come out ahead today. So, I'm planning on no sailing easy if he doesn't bring at least 5,500, um, but we'll see, depending on what Queen he sells for. And Queen, I'm planning on um, no sailing at 2,500. And uh, so, like, I think I've already said the backstory, but the backstory on Queen was, I found two two-year-old fillies for $1,000 a piece, and I didn't have $1,000. So I told my wife, I said, well, I can't afford to buy one of those, so let's just buy them both. And then me and Becca, in two weeks, will train one completely, resell it at the Ava sale, and hopefully all things work out. We'll make more money than what we spent on the two and getting it trained. So... We'll see how that works today. And then easy, sell him just to get back on the right side of the ledger uh, so we can start saving up for our annual farm payment. Okay, we've made it to the horse sale. We only have an hour to get ready. We're running a little bit late. Association will be a, a soil mare. She is called May the 4th of 2019. She's signed by the Make Mine a Double with Danny's Legacy, the Danny Joe W. Album I call Wrangler's Julia S. But Missouri's Outrageous S. The Missouri Traveler. She's double grade traveler on the bottom side. Says she's a rope to ride. Handles new situations, calmness and maturity, a season trail runners. Uh, the maturity of a season trail runner. Yeah, 
Think she's going to be a really a good family horse. She handles everything really well. Yeah. Been on trail rides by herself and with other horses. So they've had it at the river, they've jumped and climbed and slid all over. They've got a really nice little short load. Well, okay. well, I'll tell you what, here is a nice young man, a good bread man. Four times, travel four times on the bottom side. Of course, he said Danny Joe is supposed to be throwing a really calm, good disposition. Made the ball, starboard thing. Well, you had me there. I'm too old for that man. <laughs> Said a couple of weeks ago she was rather thin. They de worked her really good and put her on some supplements and you can see she's coming right along. Her hair is good and dark, shiny. But I tell you what, a nice filly right here. Just uh, two years old. No, she's never seen anything like this before. They're out here, hung out, and they're hung in about 000. So I actually ended up no sailing her because we'd fallen in love with her and decided she was worth more. But the buyer on the phone ended up coming up higher and meeting my no sale limit. So she did so. Hey. Then Lady Maud and May has known the three times getting ready to say. Oh, he's got an outstanding run walk on. he's got an outstanding run and walk on. Then he'll flat foot walk with a head shake. And for his size, he's got a really nice slope. Then he's got a really nice slope turn that will come right back to a flat foot. Said he will absolutely will not stumble. And uh, I've got the train. I'll show you how I get on. He's too tall for me. Yeah. I'm 6'4", 265 pounds. He's got large, power, and he's always going to have a good time. Said he can climb a mountain with him. Literally climb a mountain with him. He'll be racing for Zero Fox Trotting Horse. He's a Palomino Gilding. He was sold uh, July the 18th of 2017. He signed for the horse called Bound for Glory by the Booty Man. An album I called Shannondale's Big Easy, The Perfection's Charming Lad, The Potty's Perfection. Thank you. Name is Easy Spirit. You want me to help you? 
Take it and do it on, on a stump, a log, out the back of a pickup truck. Don't matter. Oh, he's a big old pretty rascal. I thought somebody ought to give me 10,000 for him just to start. What do y'all think? Alright, let's have auction.